on there that you can get off the dock in Guayaquil. You can plan ahead of time and they go, I would say they go from one star all the way up to 10 stars. So you can find any budget that you want. And one of the reasons that I decided to do that was because in doing my research, I found that the seas between um, Guayaquil, between the, um, between the, uh, between Guayaquil and between the uh, other islands is very rough. And even on our cruise, and we have, it was a, I want to say a 40 foot catamaran, 30 tons, big ship, I mean, a relatively big catamaran. We had some rocking and rolling. I mean, every ship I've been on, it doesn't bother me. There were a couple of people who were taking seasick medicine and they were fine, but there were some nights that we were really rocking. So, and I knew that that would get rough between the islands and especially between the mainland and the islands. So I was not interested in sort of doing this bumping ride, you know, between Guayaquil and all of the um, islands or between island to island. So that's why I decided to do it the way I did, but we'll talk about ways that you can get there without doing it in a catamaran. So just so we know where we are, um, it is, um, this is where you land in Baltra, um, Seymour Airport, Seymour Airport, um, the only ecologically friendly airport in the world. And as you get off there, actually, um, it was funny, we were joking. As you get off and you're walking towards the terminal, there are actually iguana along the sides of the walkway. And we, we think they planted them there, but it, it became the Galapagos experience. Like as soon as you walked off the plane, it was, it was kind of cool. So that's the airport that we get into. And that's just, you know, one of the many signs of the Galapagos when you land there. Um, so these are the islands. Um, and this is, this is actually our itinerary that we went with um, when we were there. So I think you can see that. Let me um, get rid of some of these banners, maybe. Yeah, maybe that'll make it a little easier. So we started in Baltra. We crossed... Um, the island and went through a wonderful um, El Chacho ranch. And literally you're driving, it's um, preserved land. The entire, um, all of the Galapagos is preserved land and to make sure that it stays preserved and ecologically friendly. And um, I'll tell you about how our tours and how any tour in Galapagos is organized. Um, and the tortoises were on the road, like the big, huge 150 pound, 150 year old tortoises are in the middle of the road and you have to stop or go around them. And this Chato Ranch, just Chato Ranch is a haven for these tortoises and they just give them free reign. And I'll show you some pictures and some video of that later. Um, so it's just something that um, that's where we started on our way to getting to the ship. And that was sort of the first hours of being on on there and you have lunch at Shadow Ranch. So it was it was amazing. It was really amazing. In fact, um, let me switch and show this to you. So literally you are this close to the animals when you're in Shadow. When you're in Shadow, when you're anywhere in the Galapagos, um, we maintain a six foot distance. Um, we do not touch them. We do not encourage them. We do not feed them. We do nothing to them except look at them and they look at us. But there are hundreds of these tortoises all over the place, either in a um, mud pool cooling off, hanging out on the grass, eating, whatever. And they're just all over the place. So it's pretty fascinating. So this was um, 10 days, a day in Quito at the beginning, a day in Quito at the end, and then eight days on the water. And so this was our schedule. And I'll show you more of how we knew what our schedule was and, and what happened on the trip as well. Um, and part of this Galapagos trip is the ecology and the env environmental friendliness that they are committed to. It is a huge, basically national park. Um, this is the Darwin Center and the Park Nacional de Galapagos, Ecuador. Charles Darwin um, Center does nothing but preserve and make sure the animal species that are on the Galapagos are, are evenly taken care of and not harmed. Nature takes its course and it's a very fatalistic society. Um, our tour guide was amazing. He's 15 years as a, a certified tour guide in Galapagos, lived there all of his life. And this gentleman, Omar Medina is just amazing. And I'm hoping I can get him as our tour guide when I take you guys on a tour there. Um, but 
they found that there were goats and introduced invasive species, goats and pigs, and the turtles would lay the eggs and the literally the goats or the pigs were on the other side, like eating them as the mother was dropping them into the sandy hole. So they are now at the Darwin Center um, raising um, eggs and making sure that they can get large enough to reintroduce. And eventually the plan is that they won't have to do that anymore, but between the whalers way back in the 1800s, taking hundreds of these tortoises out of the water and eating them for sustenance as they're whaling, and the predators that were introduced to the Galapagos, the turtle population, the tortoise population, as you may have read about, was decimated. So this is part of the Darwin um, Center's commitment to rebuilding the tortoise population and others and working on other things to maintain a balance. They only intervene when man has caused a problem. They, the fatalism is, you know, when they have an El Nino or an El Nino year that makes it too hot or too warm or too flooded or too rainy, that is nature creating a balance and they can't do anything about that. So they maintain a balance. And then when nature comes in and does her thing, that's what it is, and it's up to the animals to fix it. But they don't want invasive um, species to hurt native populations of animals in the Galapagos. And it, it's just an amazing, I don't think I'll ever go to a zoo again, and you may not either. So that was the Darwin Center. Blue fitted, footed boobies. So I don't know if you remember the story. I think he was a 12-year-old boy who went to the Galapagos and found out that the blue footed boobies were almost extinct or having a really hard time. And he created the blue socks. I gave them away one Christmas. Someone gave me a pair. A couple of friends of mine bought them. And those blue socks are now available in the Galapagos and all over Amazon and whatever. He's raised a lot of money to support this work. You actually pay $100 to enter the Galapagos at Customs or when you land in Seymour. And part of that, a lot of that actually goes to the scientific research and this work on the Galapagos to maintain the native species of flora, fauna, and animals there. So this is the blue-footed boobies. And I am happy to report from our guide that they are back in full strength. They're doing great. I'm gonna show you some great video of them. The blue is amazing. The blue is, is an absolutely amazing color. And the deal with them is the feet and the blue. So that's how the females choose who they're going to mate with for the season. How big are those feet to cover the eggs and hold them so that they hatch? And how blue are they? So it, it was very interesting because you saw young boobies, young male boobies with lighter colored blue. And as they got older and they ate more, their um, feathers were browner and their legs were bluer. So it's really fascinating to see. So let me show you um, one of these videos. This is... We landed and our um, guide had never seen this feeding in the morning on the island. And these are all these boobies who came from their perch on a rock face on the, to the left and just took over um, this and started feeding. All of the sardines and, and fish were in the water. So between them and the pelicans, they were having their morning feed, which they did five or six times during the couple of hours that we were there. So that was pretty fast, right? You, you see how fast and how many there were? Yeah, okay, here we go. That's a booby diving in the water. Those are many boobies, look at that dive. You see that dive? This is how these birds dive and catch the fish. Pelicans are not as elegant about it, but that dive that those boobies do, they go down they turn into missiles, as you see. They are able to close up their noses and their eyes and dive into the water. And that's how they eat. Okay? They don't catch the fish on the way down. They catch the fish as they come back up. And so as we were there, they were all doing all this diving. And then you just see this raft of boobies floating and eating their fish. You know, they've all, the flock is all fed. They're doing whatever they're going to do, right? And then they go and they start flying again and eating again. So it was a fascinating, it was just amazing being there, seeing that live. And our guide said he had never seen that before. Like he's seen a couple of them feeding, but not this whole flock. So it was pretty fascinating. And then the flamingos. The flamingos. We got to this lagoon, beautiful lagoon off of another island. And they were actually in the middle of their mating day.
It's all choreographed by nature. She's got it all figured out and they know what to do. And they wander around and I, you saw me zoom in. I wanna say we were probably 10 feet away from them. None of these animals are threatened by man. They are not touched by man or woman. Um, we respect their space and let them go where they want to go and what they want to do and kind of just move away and towards them. And it, it was just an amazing, amazing thing to see. Um, and then we're on the beaches. This is our first beach and it, the seals are just on the beach and you just wander six feet. And Omar, our guide was terrific at always grabbing our cameras or his cameras. He gave us an amazing video at the end of the tour um, and took pictures of us as a group, individuals and back of the tortoise and back of the seals. And he told us how far away to walk and where to be and um, you know, not to stomp your feet around and just sort of be kind of calm about it. Um, and then the flora and the fauna. The right side, this is native Galapagos cotton. And very important because the birds use that to make um, nests. And on the left is a succulent, and I just love that green. So I caught a picture of that. So the, the flora and the fauna there is also just amazing. From cactuses to succulents, from incense trees that has a, a marvelous incense that they make a um, oil out of, to cotton. So it's just it's just a plethora of, of flora and fauna and live animals just populating this very, very special place. There's the seals on the beach and the flamingos. Now, these underwater pictures I did not take. Um, we had a couple people um, on the uh, trip that had both cameras with casings, with waterproof casings, and others that were waterproof cameras themselves. I am considering buying a GoPro. Um, we started talking about it on the ship and a couple of people said, you know, a little waterproof GoPro. And so I may do that. I had never snorkeled on this before and I had never kayaked before. So these were all new experiences that I really enjoyed. Uh, it, it was it was amazing. So this is one of the underworld, underwater shots. And these are yellow-tailed surgeon, stur, surgeon fish. They kind of eat off of the, the reefs and all of the green lichen that grows on, on stuff underwater schools and schools and schools of fish. It was just amazing. And this is a golden iguana. There are many, the marine iguana happens to be black and red. There are about, I wanna say 12 kinds of iguana all over the Galapagos Islands that have um, changed and adapted as they have arrived at the islands, lived at the islands, and then grown and thrived at the islands. And please, Blue, Bla uh, Blue Planet with David Attenborough, National Geographic, the movies available in the documentaries about how animals arrive at the Galapagos Islands and then adapt and thrive. Because when they arrive, they may not be ready for the heat, the salt water, um, the kind of plants. Uh, these iguanas we know over time have actually changed the, the look of their face and their noses and their teeth in order to adapt to the kind of um, flora and fauna that they have to eat, the, the ground and the vegetation. The tortoises, there is a dome tortoise and a saddleback tortoise. And the saddleback tortoise adapted because they were on an island without a lot of ground green to eat. And so the um, shell goes up around their neck so they can reach for the cactuses. So those tortoises are actually eating cactus and the domed tortoises are eating grass. It's, it's fascinating how they adapted. Um, and kayaking, we went kayaking and Omar was there taking pictures and it was just amazing. And you could, the water was so clear. You could see the fish underneath you or the seals playing in the water. It was wonderful. Same with the snorkeling. One of the cactus and they have prickly pear cactuses. Um, and then I thought I'd show you the ship so you'd have an idea of um, what the ship looks like. So this was the G Adventures. It's called the, um, they, um, G Adventures is the tour company that I went with. The Sylvia Reina, Reina. Voyager is owned by a local family. They And this is a G Adventures thing. It's a locally run ship run by a locally owned family and the staff is all local. The chef, the captain, 10 crew members, 16 passengers um, on the catamaran. So that's the living area, the sort of living room. This is our dining area. Um, the, the chef was amazing. I have to tell you, I was blown away. I had no expectations. I was gonna eat whatever they fed me. It was amazing. I mean, the guy knows flavors. That's all I can tell you. Um, and that's our crew. Um, 
I would say uh, there was one, I think there were two women who were about 50 and the rest of us were definitely 60 plus plus. Um, that's the crew that we had. They were just wonderful. They were great. To, they helped us on and off the dinghy. They fed us. They took care of our rooms. They had a bull bar that they served us from. So um, it was a great, great things. That's the room. Um, it's a double. G Adventures, if you don't know, allows you to be a solo and get assigned a, um, a roommate. This case, a friend actually joined me at the last minute. So we shared the room um, or you can get the room and I think you pay, you don't pay double, but you pay more for a single if you want the room to yourself. Um, oh, I thought there was one other picture that might be out of order. That's Omar. And then this is the red sandy beach of um, Red Bee Island. No, Ratty Island. And I just thought the red, uh, you know, the thing is all you want to leave is footprints. You want to leave nothing else behind just your footprints. So I thought that was kind of fun in the sand. There they go. There's the bathroom. So it was a, it was, you know, one sink and big shower and it worked beautifully. It was, I didn't have a problem with it. Um, and this is Kicker Rock. Um, it is um, volcanic um, activity formed the Galapagos Islands as they did Hawaii and a number of other places around the globe. Um, young in comparison to the rest of the world, um, less than 5 million years old. These rocks and the reason that they have this shine to them, and especially at sunset, we we sail over there during sunset and at sunset and they turn gold and gold and golden. And it is ash. It is volcanic ash that has formed many of the mountains and hills that you see in the Galapagos Island. So you have to understand it. I think of ash as like blowing and we know that like in Iceland, it stops air traffic and it makes their air hard to breathe any volcano the amount of volcanic ash that had to fa fall for the mountains and the hills that are in in that are in um the galapagos island is huge so and this is after erosion so this used to be one big island here of rock and so over wind and rain and other storms and maybe another volcanic activity it is split but it's um, it's a, a beautiful, beautiful rock. And during the sun hitting it, it's just gorgeous. Um, and then 190 years ago, which, you know, in the lifetime of the earth is like a second, um, another volcano went up and completely covered and killed everything in its path. Animals, there were no people on the island and left very similar to Hawaii, um, this ropey kind of lava. And it's basically... All you can see besides some places where it went around um, Tortuku, I'm gonna, it's not right, but the um, lava went around mounds of dirt. Otherwise the entire thing is covered with, with lava, uh, now hardened lava. And um, I think this is, this is the intestine la lava. And this is the rope lava and slump. And you can, when you're there, you can actually see how the flow went. And then it might have hit something and sort of backed up and continued to slump. It's just, it's just a scene of black. It's beautiful, but it's also devastating at the same time because you understand what it did. We saw lava um, holes, we saw chasms. There were places where it clearly hit water and like burst and it's all jaggedy it's and there's life there are there are plants growing on it as well so um i'm sorry these are a little out of order i thought i'd done that um so this is um omar every night you had a briefing um it was optional he made it clear that he does these enrichment 30 minute enrichment talks you know every night and you didn't have to come i don't know why you wouldn't um, it's about 30 minutes and he tells us what's going to happen the next day and what we can expect. So this is what a day would look like. So, you know, you start with breakfast at seven, usually at seven. And then what do you have a wet landing or a dry landing is the kind of shoes you needed to bring with you and what we were going to be doing and how long the hike might be. I will tell you, I was surprised that almost at the middle or the end of every day when we finished a hike or something, we ended up at a beach, um, and being able to swim or snorkel. So it was a great way to cool off. So it was nice to know. And then, um, yep, bring your snorkeling gear with you. And then we come back and have some lunch and then go on a dinghy ride. And that might take us someplace else um, or the ship might move. And then we take the dinghies out. The ship came 
excuse me, with dinghies, obviously two dinghies for us, and then all of our snorkeling gear, including wetsuits in case we want. They make you more buoyant. I had never snorkeled before. He gave me one lesson and it was it changed my life, I swear to God, because I'm a big swimmer, but not having to turn my head and being able to be underwater. And they gave us the um, anti-mist or anti-fog stuff, and it made a huge difference. So it was really wonderful. And then back to the boat. And then we had a well, that night we had the welcome drink and met the crew and all of that stuff. And so every night this would come up. We take a picture of it so we knew what was going on the next day, how we had to dress. We knew whether we needed insect repellent, depending on where we were going, sun tan lotion, hats, sunglasses, all sorts of stuff. So that was how you knew what the plan for the day was the next day from the night before. Oh, that, that, that worked out well, didn't it? Okay. So that was um, the end of that. The other thing that I wanted to show you, so this was one of our... Um, sure look up, everybody. This is going to be one of those things that has been eroded in the middle, and you go from one side to the other. This is fascinating, and that's kicker rock on the other side of it. And then this was one of our sea lion friends. Popped his way up the, popped his way up the peak. You know, after a big swim, lunch. Now he's done. That's it. Yep. Okay. Got my buddy. I'm all done. Um. And those, I think, were all the videos that I wanted to, to share with you. Um, again, I would recommend that you, um, let me just get this off the stage. Hold on a second. I would recommend that you um, take a look at Blue Planet, um, David Attenborough's stuff, National Geographic, and learn more about the, um, the Galapagos because they're really a fascinating place. Um, they are sea lions, not seals. Did I say seal? They're sea lions on the Galapagos, not seals, just FYI. They're tortoises and sea turtles. We were out and snorkeling one day. I did not have an underwater camera and literally the sea, we were all sort of gathering because we saw him swimming around behind, behind, below us. And we were sort of in this circle and he just pops up like right there in front of our snorkels. It was just, it was crazy. Lots of fish, we saw sharks, white tipped sharks, black tipped sharks, lots of iguanas and lizards. So what I'd like to know from you guys is, have, how much time are you planning to go to the Galapagos? Would you like to go? And if you were going to go more than 10 days, less than 10 days, seven days, or just a weekend, you know, have you thought about it at all? So put it in the comments because I'm kind of curious. So I want to talk about logistics for a second. Um, there are lots of pros and cons to getting there that I alluded to earlier. Um, the cruise thing was my choice. Um, you can absolutely land yourself in Guayaquil, although I wouldn't recommend it now. Those of you who may be following around in the news, President Naboa has, was elected about two or three months ago and is going toe to toe with the cartels. Almost all of the drugs in the world go through Guayaquil. The, the, um, the uh, cartels own the town, they own everything in it. And so when we do Quito to Guayaquil, you stay on the plane. They pick up people and drop off people who stay in the airport. They don't leave the airport. Um, and then they fly on to Baltra and Seymour to get out to the Galapagos Islands, which has nothing to do with cartels. Everything is lovely on the island. It is 600 miles away and never the twain shall meet. However, the and in Quito, but because we were there during this curfew that Naboa had put in place, we were told not to wander around without a tour guide, without a taxi taking us, waiting for us, dropping us off, that sort of thing. So unfortunately, it was a beautiful day. We took a quick walk across the street from the Hilton to the little park to take some pictures and came back. And the warning was, if anybody comes over and tries to you know, clean you off from something, do not make sure that you rush them off, tell them to go away. That is one way that they pickpocket and, th and, and take uh, stuff from you. And we didn't know who the good guys were and the bad guys. Keto, not as bad as Guayaquil. Two or three weeks before we had gotten there, Keto was not so great. Guayaquil is still a lot in uh, flux at the moment. And Naboa is just not giving up and neither is the cartel. So the lesson for this to me and what we learned was you fly into Quito. It's a 45 minute ride from the Quito airport to downtown where the hotel was that they chose to put us at. And I think the idea is that you get a day before and a day after to explore Quito or take tours or whatever it is that you would like to do. Um, but because of what was going on, we really didn't have that time. So it meant five trips to the airport <laughs> when you arrived. 
when you went back to go to, to Guayaquil, when you came back to go to the hotel, and then when you went back to the airport to leave. So what I am thinking about, uh, and then what we found out is, so we had eight people in the Hilton in downtown Quito. And we said, oh, there are only eight of us on a ship for 16. She goes, oh, no, 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 we'll pick up another six people in Guayaquil. So people had bought the cruise, the whole cruise, which is what we had bought. And other people had only bought the cruise out of Guayaquil with no hotels. And my partner, and I really kind of felt like you didn't need to be in Quito. You could have just gone. And I had actually said, I can fly from Santiago to Guayaquil and was told, no, 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 you can't because then you'll miss the hotel and we don't know it would pick you up. Every plane that leaves for the Galapagos stops in Guayaquil to refuel and to pick up people. So we will probably figure out something about either meeting in Santa Cruz Island, which is where the ship was that we end eventually ended up to pick up the ship or in Guayaquil at the airport, which is where we got picked up. Omar met us there. We took a bus to a water ferry across to a car and then went to the Chacho Ranch, had lunch, saw the tortoises, did a lava tube, and then eventually ended up in downtown Santa Cruz where we caught the dinghy out to the boat. So I think there are ways of making it a little more efficient on the going and the coming. Um, you can also, you can go to Guayaquil. I would not recommend it right now, but lots of folks that I've talked with have gone to Guayaquil themselves and they just kind of walk up and down and find folks that are offering tours. You have to go to the island with a licensed naturalist. You will not get on an island. You cannot get on an island. The whole idea is that they are protecting this place. So they have a license, they have a badge, they get you in and out of places. And so you can't just get on a boat and go. So you have to you have to be part of a, a tour or one-on-one -on -one with somebody. And you can do that in Guayaquil and find places or go to Baltra and find someone. It's just again, it was the bouncing, you know, some of the some of the rides are two and a half to three hours between islands, depending on how you're going. And then you need to find either accommodations which aren't always available because there's a very limited population in, in the whole Galapagos. So they're only centers. So you're going to still have to take quite a little ride from even, you know, from Baltra to Santa Cruz or from Santa Cruz to Isabel Island or to another island. And it can get kind of rough. So that's why I said ship as opposed to hopping on and off of little, little boats. Um, there is no D DIY. I mean, you can put this together yourself, but you've got to have a tour guide to take you with you. Um, and I just mentioned about, you know, the hotels and the flights and things like that. Um, time of year, it's an equator. It has a wet season and a dry season. It was beautiful when we were there. It got a little hot, but honestly, you know, we were wearing our bathing suits and before we went to lunch, we'd all jump in the in the water and swim for a bit and the dinghies would pick us up. We'd go back for lunch. We'd take a snooze for a couple of hours or just read or whatever we wanted to do. And then we'd start the afternoon activities. Um, so you could go anytime really. Um, and then pre and post cruise, what happens is a lot of people end up in Gua uh, Galapagos because they've taken a cruise ship like I did. I started in December in LA and then got off the ship in January in Santiago and realized I could do Galapagos and Machu Picchu and the Antarctic ex um, expedition. Buenos Aires right now is like 95 with 80% humidity. I was just there two days ago and I could not wait to get, it actually got, I couldn't wait to get out of there. And I, it actually got hotter. So it was a beautiful day. And then at night at nine o'clock, it got hotter. So I'm finding Santiago and Lima much more uh, doable and much more comfortable this time of year. I was talking to somebody and they said, everybody comes here January, you know, December-ish to January through to sort of March, because that's when the cruise ships come. They said, but it's really beautiful here from March and April. So depends on your time of year and your vacation time and when you want to go, but it's it'll be cooler you know, as the summer ebbs here a little bit because you're, or the heat of the summer ebbs here a little bit on the on the um, equator. Um, so with that, I want to encourage you to join my email list on wheresbabs.com and I'll give you a little incentive. Um, many of you know that I'm going to be, uh, I started my travel agency business. I've gotten a couple friends and family. Thank you if you're 
on here. I haven't taken a look yet. Um, I appreciate your business. And um, I charge a $500 travel planning fee, which is waived if you join the, the mailing list. So you'll get my blog and information on tours and things that'll be coming up at the end of 24 and 25. I'm planning um, that far ahead for some of these cruises and focusing on uh, Galapagos and Antarctic and the Arctic and Iguazu Falls. And I'll talk about that one probably next week or the week after when I get back from uh, Machu Picchu, Cuba, Australia, I think you all know is a is a love of mine, Iceland. And we'll do a little cruising if people are interested in that. But um, we'll be looking at stuff for 24, 25 small groups, things that are easy to do as couples or solos and hoping not hoping to be able to keep the price reasonable as a solo traveler myself. I get that. Um, so you can go to wheresbabs.com and sign up on the website for um, to join the mailing list. Love for you to do that. Um, and now let me get to your questions. Um, please put them in here if you have any questions. I'm so happy to see you guys. It's really wonderful to, to share this with you. And, and you know, my love of travel is, I love it. So for you guys to hear what's going on, I'm, I'm very excited. And I think the Galapagos, honestly, never go to a museum, a uh, museum at zoo again. It was just mind boggling to be that close. I love the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Like that was my favorite, you know, aquarium. And now to have seen these sea lions, like, you know, six feet away from me laying there and barking. And we had a couple of alphas while we were in the dinghy, you know, making sure we stayed away from his harem of, of sea lionesses. It was, it was insane. It was just crazy. So, um, so glad to see you guys there. Oh, Karen, yay, and Beth, Teresa, hello, everybody. And Serendipity, so glad you're back. Thank you. Um, yeah, and Sonia from New Zealand. But if you have any questions at all, you can always reach me at Babs, B-A-B-Z, at wheresbabs.com or through the um, website. You can always go there and shoot me an email. But I hope you you got some value and, and I shared, I hope I came across with some love of the Galapagos Islands because it is an amazing place. And I just, I think we all have to go there. And it was also a lot of ability to sort of just slow down. Oh, oh, let me just talk about internet for a minute. So um, I think they called it spotty. I would call it non-existent and that's okay. Um, I, but I think we all had a different expectation about whether we would have access or not. And there were a couple things going on where I needed internet back home. Um, there was no internet. And so we'd sort of get it Suddenly it would show up or we'd wake up in the morning and overnight we had clearly passed some little city along the island, the archipelago, and some messages had come through. So um, I personally think we need to find a satellite um, that we can hook on to while we're there for 10 days or eight days because I think it's, it's helpful. So, yeah. Um, let's see, Beth. What was, let me see, I should put that on here. Uh, what was, oh my God, it was so warm. It, I mean, not warm, warm. Um, I would, I don't really like wearing, it's a short scuba suit, you know, short sleeves and shorts, one piece. And I don't really like wearing them, but it gives you some more buoyancy. I feel personally, the water was the perfect temperature. I don't know what that would be. Maybe it's 70 um, and you're hot and in your bathing suit, you just, I just walked in. Like it was not even chilly to me and it felt so refreshing. Um, the pool that I was at in um, in Iguazu Falls at the hotel is no shade. And I came home so sweaty from go being at the falls. I was like, oh, my God, the pool. The pool was like, I think it was like 95 degrees. I don't want to know what was growing in there, to be honest with you. So this was just so refreshing after, you know, we had some long hikes that we did. Um, and you got a little hot. We all carried water. We knew what we had to carry with us. But, you know, at the end of a two-hour wander, and it was a wander, like it's a hike, but Omar will stop and talk to you about the birds and the flora and the, the greenery and what the island may have looked like and why it looks like what it looks like today. So it's not like you were hiking for two full hours. But by the time you got back to the beach, you were glad to jump in that water. And the same thing in the snorkeling and the kayaking. It was, I for me, it was perfect temperature. No one said they were cold. Everybody agreed that it was really a comfortable temperature. I'm sorry, I don't know exactly the temperature, but it was really comfortable. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, Beth, you know, I don't even know that it was on my bucket list. I'll be honest with you, but it was too close to proximity not to give it a shot. I figured as long as I came all this way, my, why not give it a try? Um, and I think our eight days was good. I didn't feel rushed through anything. Now I will tell you, they did send us out a notice probably 
three weeks before. Um, so that's one big national park. So that's the other thing. So with the tours, so Omar made it really clear to us that every tour guide gets their marching orders from the national park. So where we went, the time we were there, when we were on the island, where the boat was docking, when we could snorkel, when we could kayak, and was all laid out by the park. So that that map that I showed you when we first started, um, let me see if I can get to that real quick. Um, let me just go back. So this map was all made up by the park and told him, you, this is where you need to be, and this is when you need to be there. And the captain knew when he, where he had to dock the ship, the whole thing. And so all of this was prescribed. But avian flu has hit Antarctica and the Galapagos. So we were unable to go to Genovese or to Flor, Floriana, yeah, Floriana Island. Um, there were two things. One is, you know, do you really want to see a lot of dead birds or some dead birds and penguins? And we don't want you to transfer it to human or to another island. So it was a, it was a, um, what do you call it? Uh, when you keep people in quarantine. And so, and again, that's sort of a nature thing. You know, they don't, they don't intervene. This is something that happens. It came in from South America um, on the birds. They brought it from South America over to the Galapagos and that stuff happens, right? So, um, but you know, you don't know what you didn't miss, Beth, because I mean, it wasn't like, you know, Omar said, oh my God, you know, you should. No, we saw so much and it was so lovely and we learned so much while we were there. Um, I could have skipped the two days in Quito on either end and happily spent, you know, probably 10 days on the water, two weeks on the water. I mean, that would have definitely busted the budget, but yeah, it just, you know, I'm, I'm a swimmer and I love being in the water. So those afternoons or mornings when we jumped in the water after a hike, oh, I was just like in heaven. Um, let's see, what else are you asking here? Um, take a catamaran cruise. Yes. That was the whole idea. Yes. So the idea was the catamaran. We met the catamaran in, um, off of Boltra. Um, and then once we were on the ship, we stayed on the ship for the whole eight days. That was where we slept, ate, dinghied. Um, the dinghies took us out to snorkel. Um, the dinghies took us out to um, kayak and then brought us back in. Um, yes, we were on the ship. And that was what I mean. So even in a big catamaran, you could feel the waves. And, and he would tell us, um, Omar, the night before would say, okay, we are going from this island to this island and it's going to get really bumpy. So if you haven't taken your seasickness, you know, stuff, or you think it's going to be bad when you're sleeping, take it now. So before you go to bed, you're going to be feeling better. I kind of love the rocking and rolling, so I don't care. But there were three people on the ship. No one got sick there because they were taking their meds, but they were like, oh, yeah. And I brought patches with me. So I gave those to some folks. I don't know if they didn't have it or it wasn't working. I'm not sure. But it was a great um, three-day patch. That, you know, I thought it was, I didn't even know what it was because I hadn't used it. The doctor gave it to me. You know, I got it before I left for both the cruise and for this. And it uh, it's a three-day patch. You just put behind the ear and they swore by it. They said it was fabulous. And that's the reason I picked this, Beth, because I wanted to be on a ship and I wanted to go between islands by ship. Um, I think he said there are some small airports, but no one goes to the islands by air, really. It's only by ship. But the thing is, you can get on in Santa Cruz and you could be like on a speedboat, large or small, or a day yacht, or you can be on a big catamaran. So I just didn't want the bumpiness of a little speedboat or a yacht. And I'm glad that I picked a more substantial boat that also had a little bit of wobble to it, which I didn't care about. Um... Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Sonia, it's always on the tape, Sonia. You can watch it anytime you want. Forever on the on the web, right? Forever in the cloud. That's fine. Um, it, it, it was amazing. Um, and did you see, I see so, yes, they're called marine, yes, they're called marine iguanas. And they are um, black with a red back on them, which is an evolution for them. They came over all black and they turned red because of all the iron ore in the uh, land that came up from the volcanoes and made the land that is today. Um, it's, it's a very rich uh, ore and mineral place. 
that is not being mined clearly, which is good. But a lot of South America, all of South America has minerals and ores that are very, very, very valuable, not only to themselves, but as export, as a um, place of um, earning money for the for the country or the state that they're in. Um, yeah, it was fascinating seeing them. They are not my favorite animal. I'm much more a seal and a blue booby person than um, those iguanas. They are prehistoric. I mean, you look at them, I mean, the plates sort of on their arms and things like that, they just look prehistoric. There was a quickie um, blue planet that we watched about how the iguanas, when they may have come, or even over the years that they've been studying them, they may have been two feet long and they they shrunk by at least a third. And they say the only reason that, that happened was not only did the body and the fat and the muscle mass and everything else shrink, but the bone and the skeleton also shrank. It's fascinating about the evolution of these animals. And they came over in on the Humboldt um, current or currents around, and they may have ended up, you know, from the west coast of South America on a raft, you know, just sort of a grassy raft that got caught in a current. They can live for two weeks without water and food. 600 miles, I guess that's two weeks. They hit the Galapagos Islands and have to figure stuff out and mother nature and evolution takes the rest of it. So, I mean, I hated geology growing up. I hated it in high school. I hated it in college. I thought it was rocks, the middle of the molten earth. I really did not care. And between my tour around South America, uh, the Chilean Fords and Antarctica, and now the Galapagos, it just blows me away. It's, it's really fascinating. Um, other questions? Um, anything else, everybody? I don't want to leave you. I know it's late in your evening and, and you want to go to work, but I really appreciate you coming and tuning in. My plan is on the 20th, you got, you got first dibs on this, you guys, 20th of, um, well, I, okay. Iguazu Falls. February 20th, 8.30 Eastern, 7.30 Central, 5.30 Pacific, we're going to do another live on Iguazu Falls. And I was just there um, a day ago. I just came back today uh, to Lima to get to um, uh, Cusco to go to Machu Picchu. Uh, we leave on Saturday and I'll be back the following Saturday. It is going to be a muddy, rainy mess in Machu Picchu. <laughs> Yay! So anyway, um, but I'll be talking about Iguazu Falls because that was just, it was pretty, it was an amazing couple of days there, hot and humid, but it was an amazing couple of days. And another, you know, it's the seventh wonder of the world, a UNESCO um, heritage site, all that in a bag of chips. It was crazy. It was really amazing. I did it from the air in a helicopter and then went down on the boat in the water and got, um, got completely wet. So it was wonderful. Um, any other questions, please email me or call me or WhatsApp me, whatever works for you. I am just thrilled that you all came by to, to hear what was going on in the Galapagos. Katie, don't worry about it. It's on record. You can watch it anytime you want. So I appreciate you guys all coming and I look forward to seeing you on my mailing list. And please don't hesitate to send me an email if you have any questions and more about the tours and what Where's Babs will be, that Where's Babs will be putting together for everybody. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Have a good night. And thanks so much for, uh, for coming by. I appreciate it.